Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Dawson. Welcome to Leader Talk. This show is proudly brought to you by Brainiac. Each week we are meeting with incredible leaders from around the world to discuss all things leadership and business insights. Each person coming on this talk show has given up their valuable time for one very clear purpose, to give back to small and medium business owners. Many of us will agree that our ability to clearly describe and position our products and services will help with business success. And today, my co-host CEO of Peerlight, Gus Arianto, and I are fortunate to chat to our guest speaker, Todd Towers, founder and CEO of Farm Boy Fine Arts. Farm Boy Fine Arts is an international art advisory with a hand in hospitality, health and wellness and fine art leasing, with their operations being based in Canada. We know that art has different value to different audiences and Todd's ability to position his products and business can help us all learn how to better position our own products and services. Welcome to the show, Todd. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hello, Todd. Thank you for donating your time, uh, especially on the last day of most organization. Today is the last day and you donating your time for Leader Talk. Uh, can't say enough. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. Well, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're always working. So uh, hey. to be here and, and, and crossing time zones, it's, uh, it's, it's great. It's nice to see your faces. Thank you. Fantastic. And Todd, we ask all our wonderful guests two fun questions whenever we begin Leader Talk. So we've prepared yours and we'd love to ask them, if you could live anywhere in the world for one year, where would you live? It's, it's uh, I mean, having having grown up where i grew up i grew up in a really uh, a rural uh environment in 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 western canada a province called alberta uh, a small town called red deer on a family ranch here that my my family homesteaded and um you know it's always great to be here it's uh you know it's a place that uh, i most identify with and uh, of all the places i travel in the world this is one that's closest to my heart so i love being here um uh, that's kind of that's sort of number one ranks. But I always, you know, I, I was just uh, in Miami for Art Basel a week or so ago, and and you know, Miami uh, is 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 sort of like a, a wonderful, uh, very rich cultural place. So it's a fun place to be. A complete different <laughs> different type of place than being here on the ranch, but. Uh, so, so two are two are welcome to me, but the uh, ranch sort of holds number one. Oh, fantastic. And if you could magically become fluent in any language, what would it be? You know, it's, it's funny. I mean, we've we've done opportunities and deals all around the world and, and we do a lot of work in the Middle East. And I, I, I love Arabic. I think it's a beautiful language. But when whenever I've been in, in China and certainly mainland China, I feel completely lost. So, you know, knowing Mandarin would be uh, would be something that would be very helpful to me and would be uh, would be a welcome uh, language to have in my uh, in my back pocket. Yeah. So Mandarin. Yeah. Sure. What about you, Gus? Do what if you could magically become fluent in any language? Uh, probably I will learn French uh, because uh -huh. uh, for some reason, it sounds complicated. I think if I suddenly can speak French like uh, a lot of people in uh, Canada, I I probably will be uh, you know impressive. I don't know. I can, I can say only few words in French, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's the language I wanna I wanna learn. Oh, yeah, fantastic. And and look, Todd, you know, I gave a brief intro introduction about um, yourself at the beginning, but we were hoping you could tell everyone a bit more about yourself. And also about Farm Boy Fine Arts. Sure, happy to. Thank you. So Farm Boy is a, is a company I founded 20 years ago. Um, you know, funny enough, it was it was my nickname when I was going through art school. So as I mentioned, I grew up here. I mean, I'm in Alberta now. I, I live in Vancouver. The company is headquartered in Vancouver. Um, but we always come home for Christmas and, and spend time here during Christmas and summer at the ranch. So I'm back back at my family property. Um, but but uh, yeah, growing up, I uh, I left the ranch, went to art school. 
my nickname was Farm Boy. And uh, as I as I exited art school, uh, founded this business, uh, really under the principle that I, I loved art. I was passionate about it. I saw the need for it to be in other places other than galleries and institutions, and wanted to bring art to, you know, other other environments, corporate environments, hospitality, uh, healthcare environments. And uh, really, that was the vision. Um, our, our, our mission's always been to change lives with art, and we've sort of led through that for the last 20 years. So, um, you know, sort of founding that business 20 years ago to where it started sort of with one, cl one client to, um, you know, having the fortune, good fortune to support our clients all around the world um, from global hospitality, luxury clients to we are Ford Motor Company's global art advisor. So we support uh, Ford Motor Company all around the world um, to healthcare environments and, and supporting hospitals and clinics in, uh, in in lots of different spaces and typologies. It's been a really wonderful journey and 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 uh, great to see my team's ability to impact people's lives through art in each of those differing spaces. So, wow, wow, fantastic! Uh, what a great success! Uh, I uh, I have a question straight away. Like I I love the way you describe your mission to change life through art. I mean, I mean, we all love art, I assume, where, and art is more than painting, you know, music is art. Eh, there are, uh, people, I think, can describe art in a different way, but, you know, that's such a strong mission or vision, you know, to change life through arts. Can you, can you share with us more about that part? Because that's really, really uh, interesting how you describe it. Yeah, happy to. I, I mean, I think so. Art for a lot of people is intangible. You know, we we know we love it, whether that's theater, whether that's music, whether that's dance. You know, uh, the written word or visual arts. Uh, for me, I've really felt that you know our focus was visual arts and placing that in in spaces where people could enjoy it. So the the vision to really try to change people's lives with art isn't isn't upon this always this life shattering event. But it's really about how do we make people see something, take pause, enjoy it, learn from it, uh, engage with it, be challenged by it, uh, and contribute to their well-being in their life. And there's lots of ways that we do that in, in differing uh, business sectors and typologies. But but in the very simplest form, it's when you meet something, you look at it, and you can engage with it and think, I've just I've just seen something that's made me feel a little better, or it's contributed to my well-being today. So in terms of our business process and practice, we've never done anything outside of that lens. We've always approached any new business sector, any new idea that we have come into the business through that lens. If it doesn't meet that, we don't do it. You know, sorry, Ned, I, I know we have a lot of questions that we want to ask Todd, but this part really resonated to me when we spoke, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, Todd, you mentioned that, uh, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but... Uh, you know, even to the extent you actually do research, which is we will discuss that further when people actually stop in the corridor to have sure. a moment, whether it's 30 seconds, 20 seconds, one minute, two minutes, five, whatever it is, so they can refocus on their body. I mean, that is just like outstanding, right? Like when people talk about to change life, uh, we kind of thinking change life mean, you know, uh, giving people house, water, wh whatever it is, right? There's a lot of ways. But yeah. when you describe it to me, it's so simple yet so powerful to make people stop because what's missing in the world right now is the ability for people to pause. And you actually yeah. are fighting that in the world. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, thank you. I think I think um, in in the process in which we help facilitate that management, manage that is in, in different sectors and typology. So, so let's, let's, let's give a, let's give a couple examples. When, when we're producing artwork and placing artwork in a hospitality environment. So we, we've said for a very long time that when I started this business, art was sort of one of the last things you thought about when you're walking into a, a hotel, quite, quite literally, people would buy prints and just frame prints out uh, from some print inventory had nothing to do with the hotel, nothing to do with the brand, nothing to do with the, the, the guest. But where we've taken it to is really an understanding of what we can do 
in, in a geocentric space to a, to a client base, to a particular public that is in whatever geo region we're working in the world and really work specifically to them. So we're speaking to that audience. So when someone walks into a hotel environment, they're identifying, they're identifying with something that's maybe close to them, that, that resonates with them and what makes them inherently want to spend more time in that space. So how does that roll up to a hotel? Um, if I'm placing a great art collection in a hotel, then the net knock on effect of that is that people want to spend more time there. So they come into the lobby, they think, oh, this is wonderful art. It looks great. It smells great in here. It's designed well. I'm going to sit down and have a cocktail or I'm going to come back and have dinner. Well, that's revenue to the hotel. If the, if the property's been thoughtful in how we roll out that art collection through the through the rooms, through the common areas, guest experiences, spas, lobbies, and all of that starts to work together through a narrative, which we will inevitably create with them and for them, people start to feel more connected to the experience in the space, makes them want to come back, makes them want to stay longer, makes them potentially want to pay more for their room if it's really good. So, so these things are, you know, are, are pieces of data that we pull from and really work to develop better art collections for our clients. If you look at it through the, through the healthcare lens, specifically right now is a very, very trying time for all healthcare workers. So if I'm a nurse, <clears throat> I've just put in a crazy shift. I've walked, you know, 15 kilometers <laughs> from one end of the hospital to the other. And there's no place for me to take pause. My day gets even longer. So if, if we've done our job right, we can walk in, work with the architects and designers and build points of um, pause for those workers, for those guests, you know, people coming into the hospital to see loved ones and for the staff themselves to be going by and see a wonderful piece of art. Maybe it's a lighting installation, maybe it's a digital piece, but maybe it's a physical or analog piece. And they, and they have a moment to sit down, take pause and reflect just gather themselves in that space, it recharges you and it makes you, uh, you know, more ready for the next whatever hour, five hours, 10 hours of your shift or day. So that's what we really focus on in, in, in those spaces of wellness. And we're to the point of research, we're looking at how we can, how we can better uh, really attenuate that research to, to get actual physical data that the hospitals can use. So setting up, you know, um, areas that we can test people, we can do um, set up blind rooms, put, put artwork in each one and have people go in and do cortisol tests to see which one's spiking, which one's bringing you down. And so that you can you can start to really work towards uh, uh, an art collection that is helping people heal and uh, get better in their stay. That's just amazing. And, you know, Todd, when you were describing the artworks in hotels, for example, I clearly remember staying uh, in a hotel in Dubai and every single angle had this incredible artwork, whether it was a foyer with a grand piano, whether you're going to a lift, it was just so cleverly done. I don't know how many hundreds of photos the family and I took there because everything was staged so cleverly and everything had a different atmosphere. You couldn't just take that photo to capture that entire level. You had to take it with every piece of artwork. So, you know, it's incredible to actually hear from you just how much work goes into the selection process. It's not just we're going to pop that one there and that's going to work there. It's clearly a lot of research done. It's a lot of research. It's a lot of understanding who, who your demographic is that you're serving who your brand and client is. We really work with the brands to support them um, and then understanding where, where they are in the world. So one hotel, it's maybe in a chain, it's not going to look completely similar to one. One in Dubai would even look different than, than one in Abu Dhabi because there's a, there's a slightly different demographic um, and you want to have a different experience between Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So, you know, we really work to to when we're building those collections curate specifically for the region the people the typologies that we're in and and, and you, natalie you make a good recommendation or reference there is when people are walking through a hotel and taking pictures <clears throat> we, we, these sort of instagram moments that we talk about there's a whole social connection there that you're relating about your experience and and that 
experience with the art now becomes part of your social experience and part of your, as we would sort of say, social flex, like the, 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 the thing that identifies you with the places that you are when you show that. So art has a big contribution factor to that and a big value to the hotel and the brand. Yeah, look, absolutely. And, you know, I, I would want to know, you're really passionate clearly about what you do and clearly a really passionate leader. How do you actually balance this passion with, you know, running your own business versus keeping this passion alive within the rest of your team? Because clearly you're the business owner, but it seems that everyone there is just so passionate about art. So I think it, it, what what we try to work really hard at at Farm Boy is building a values aligned organization. So when we're looking at term in terms of recruitment and bringing people on into the company, we look at those folks. We call each other farm hands. So so net new farm hands have a particular um, interest and passion. They don't necessarily have to be art collectors or lovers of art, but they there has to be an understanding and affinity towards a learning around it and 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 sort of this this feeling that it is important. Um, we have that same that same value lens with our clients, so we're always looking to onboard both farm hands uh, and clients through that same sort of value lens that appreciates art. Um, and we're, you know, Farm Boy Fine Arts is called Farm Boy for a reason. We're, 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 not, we're not stuffy about it. <clears throat> we take our work very seriously and we, we love art. Obviously, we're really passionate about it, but we're also very open and democratic in the process. So we're, we're driving our intention through sometimes consensus. We really want people to get engaged. We want to help educate. We want to understand that everyone at the table has an equal experience and um, a, a different lens, but we're contributing to that, always that that value of, of changing lives with art. So our farmhands that come into the business, they, 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 seem to, um, they seem to really attach themselves to that and they find value in that. And I also would extend to, to, the, to the point where we're seeing new recruitment Certainly through COVID, this is not just us. This is everyone, I think, in, that's, that's dealing with this. People are changing careers. They're looking at new ways to do things. They're, they're, they're looking at how they adapt their lives and going after things that they maybe were more passionate about because life can be short and it's, it's, it's a strange time. So we're really finding people come to the business that are not just looking solely for a paycheck. <clears throat> they're really looking for obviously fair compensation and a great culture to be in, but, but they're chasing their passions too. And, and we're seeing a lot of folks come into the business that, that, that are aligning those pieces with us. Wow. That's a, that's a incredible, the way you describe it. Um, I have one question that come through, you know, come back to your vision or where you want to change life through arts, but business is a business means that you have an infrastructure of a business that you need to fund. You know, we, we all want to make a difference mm -hmm. in the business. But every day you wake up, you need to understand the cost of running the business itself. How do you how do you balance that? Because if if everyone in your organization, I assume, thinking how to change. I mean, of course, we need to do that. I believe I'm, I'm strongly believe in that, too. But how do you balance it between that and also running a business itself? I, I hope my question is clear there. I just want to learn from you where your vision are very, very in, infinite, you know, to change life through art, which is I like. But business itself on day to day basis required a lot of finite decision to keep that business going. Uh, how do sure. you balance that? So uh, it's a great question, Gustav. And, and I would say that, you know, I went to art school and I grew up on a farm. So I'm no master business mind. You know, I, I didn't have a business education. I don't have an MBA. I didn't go to business school. Um, I'm entrepreneurial and, and I love art. So I, I would I would preface that, that it there was no clear 20 years ago, finite plan about how I was going to make money at this. Right. It was if if I have passion for this and there's a will, there's a way. Um, okay. So my early pricing systems were very rudimentary. But 
I, I would state that, you know, in, in looking at building, you know, a, a, an economic model that makes sense, it's obviously you have to be able to, you have to build revenue and the revenue has to be good revenue. Um, so good revenue to us is a bit of a, is a bit of a, a marriage between advisory services where we support clients with our expertise time, you know, and we charge for that. And then part of our other businesses is we actually, uh, we, we, in selling other artists work, we sell artists work bundled into product, which would be framed, you know, arts and prints and things like that. that get rolled out in hotels. Oh, my son just showed up. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, so in that, you know, we're, we build margin into that and obviously build the business model that, that makes sense. I mean, a very simple analogy was when I started the business, I was serving clients and, and sort of placing art in kind of one environment. And that, that was a lot of work to build those stories and those narratives to make sense in that one space. Maybe it was a small business office or a restaurant. And I kind of looked at the hotel space by saying, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, guys. This is the this is what happens. Um, about saying if if I went into a hotel environment and I did the same amount of work, but rolled it out across 500 hotel rooms or 2,000 hotel rooms, there's there's more margin there, so more money to be made by gross. So it, it was it was a very simple system to start, uh, and it just we had the opportunity to scale it and and become more sophisticated in our in our business practice and and modeling out our revenue and how we were going to do it over time. I will repeat this at the end. If you have a passion and a will, there is always a way. Yeah. And I think that I will put it also uh, uh, on my desk here because I think that's great. You know, you openly said, hey, I'm not sophisticated on any way, but I have a passion about changing the life of others through art. And look at me now, international business. Top. No, that's just amazing. Sorry, Nat, this is a topic that I... As no, you know, it is. And there's so different. many questions we have for you, Todd. But one that one that I wanted to ask, you mentioned COVID-19, the uncertainty, challenging times. From a leadership perspective, how do you find yourself managing this uncertainty with your team? It's a, it's a kind of question. I mean, everyone manages it differently, but just curious to know, I mean, you're running this globally. So how do you actually manage this? So it's a good question. I think we're all... <clears throat> we're all learning from, from this, but I think, you know, entrepreneurs are good at pivoting. So I think when, when this hit us, uh, we quickly pivoted and we, we understood what we could and could not do within our own authority. The difficult piece for us, which we did not see coming, I've been through a couple of recessions before, um, hospitality can be challenging um, in terms of those cycles, but this we did not see coming. We, we thought there was something coming in terms of the next, because things had been very bullish and there'd been a lot of development. We thought we might see a bit of a slowing coming into the next couple of years, but we did not expect this. So for us, the challenge was in hospitality business, serving our clients in cruise, uh, serving our clients in hotels all around the world, went to zero, literally went to zero overnight. Like someone shut the light off on our business overnight. Fortunately, we had been pivoting and moving some of our work to advisory services with some of the fortune sort of 50 clients and, and helping them in their spaces, um, which, you know, we could quickly pivot to, but still work inside of supporting our hospitality clients when needed and when ready. Um, but maybe more pointed to your, to your question would be, how do we manage that internally with our team? We really had to get an understanding of everyone's comfort uh at the at the organization at the team's level um who was comfortable and not everybody was comfortable at the same time who who could who could we initially had to all work remote so then it was how do we prepare everybody to be remote immediately um so get everyone set up to do that and then when we could start to come back to the office who's comfortable coming back to the office when so phasing that building out opportunities for people to connect uh either like this digitally uh, or in person when appropriate and, and when we could. So, you know, it, it, it's definitely a challenging time. It still continues to be. We've got a new variant around and we're still working through some things. But, um, you know, we just, we just as entrepreneurs, have to roll with it. And I think everyone in the small, you know, medium business space has had to and has been hit hard by this. Um, I think one thing that we did do that was probably different 
was we we looked at this as an opportunity to reinvest in our talent pool and really build uh, our team up. So while we were not 100% busy with hospitality work, we were busy in other sectors and we wanted to onboard more folks that could support that business and elevate um, uh, those, those clients and support them. Uh, so we were actually hiring uh, through this, this process. Um, which, which can get a little nerve wracking <laughs> when you're, when you're dealing with, you know, losing part of your revenue through a business that you're used to having it. Um, but we invested in, in the team and, and the people with the, you know, with the understanding that this isn't forever and we're going to see our way through this and, and coming out the other side to be more proactive and be prepared for what we believe will be a very bullish market. Um, because people want to travel. They don't not want to travel. And those hotels and cruise ships, and everybody has to get back to work. So we've really hired into that to support it on the next side. You know, it's it funny, Todd, when I listen to you explaining about, uh, let's pivot the business. Let's, you know, because, you know, as a, as a business owner, you know, when you hit in one way, and this is your passion, uh, the business passion you have, you need to find a way. Uh, from the outside, it's easy to understand. Yeah, of course, you need to pivot because otherwise you die. Because if one door closes and you just stand in front of the door, then you die. But I'm saying it because uh, in a different lens, I'm uh, leading an organization, but I'm not a business owner myself. So when we pivot, the money comes from someone else. Mm -hmm. Now, in your case, the money comes from you. Pivot come with a lot of risk, a lot of, I'm assuming, loneliness at night for you to even thinking what would happen if it didn't work. What's your message to a lot of small and medium business owner that need to pivot, um, especially during the toughest night when they feel like, you know, revenue is closed one way. Now you have a money, limited money, as like many business owners. And you want to use that money for something that no guarantee. Is that any particular key ways to actually improve your sleep? Maybe that, that's the question. I mean, it must be a sleepless night to, to use the money uh, in something that you call risk. How yeah. Do you mean? Yeah. I, 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 so, you know, I've got the good fortune. I've got a, I've got a good business partner. Uh, so the two of us own the business together. And I think having that as a leader in support, there's often, it, you know, when you're when you're owning owning and running a business, um, there's just not a lot of of places that you can go and talk to in the heat of the moment. So you know, we're fortunate we can bounce things off one another and we share that risk. <clears throat> so I guess we share those sleepless nights together. But you know, I would I would just. I would say that, you know, anyone that's going through it certainly is you have to feel very confident about where you're going. You have you have to um, sort of you have to put it on the line. Um, and, and, you know, when you don't have which we don't have a, a, a external investment, we don't have backers. It's it's us. It's our money. Um, if it goes poorly, we have to shoulder that. We have to shoulder that risk. But in some ways, having that responsibility, it makes it all the much more meaningful and it makes your decision making very clear. So, you know, you you get you get to the root of what you have to do very quickly when you're in those situations. And um, the decision making, although very foggy and there's a lot of sleepless nights, you can get to that point of clarity about what you have to do quite quickly. It's not easy. Um, but you know, it's what, it's, it's what we all do as entrepreneurs, isn't it? Yes. And, and I'm always, you know, Natalie is a business owner. You are a business, like looking at both of you, I always impressed because the money we talk about is impacting your home directly. Like, uh, that's just amazing. Uh, you need to have a lot of passion and will like what you say. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We, we, we. So I, my business partner and I often talk about this. It's not, it, we sort of think about it. It's not, it's not us. It's we're looking through the lens of the, of our team, of our farm hands. So, you know, it's not only our responsibility, it's our responsibility for them. Yes. So how do we manage this best through, through, for the team? Uh, what's our best outcome? 
that does come with some tough decisions, as you know, uh, sometimes. But we're we're always looking at um, you know we've got some we've got some ten, we've got some long term folks at Farmville. We've got people that have been with us for fourteen years. So um, you know we're really in essence the farmhands are our family. So we're we're thinking about that decision making is tough, but it's not just for us, right? We have to think about how it affects everybody in the organization. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. And look, I know we didn't really touch on leadership, Gus, but you're so passionate about the business insight. So we're going to kind of move it now officially to that side. And we want to um, bring in more about the, the question about, you know, pricing and understanding values. So, you know, we all know that art is abstract, but curious, and I have been curious since the moment we had our first conversation is, how do you actually understand its value? And then on top of that, know how to correctly price the artwork for example and right. i think this so, is important um just to add i think this is important for our audience thought because most business have a tangible products whether it's a noodle shop a mechanic a plumbing shop uh, we, we we have we have a tangible product arts mm. is uh whilst you have the product the value itself uh, that's what we want to learn from you if you can create value on arts, I think we can create value on many, many things. Absolutely. Right. So I, I think when we look at it, we look at there is an existing art market out there. There is an existing collector art market and art is it, it is an asset. Uh, there is an intangible value to art, but there's also an actual value traded on marketplaces and primary and secondary markets. So in the collectible space, I'll give you sort of a piece of data. Out of 100% of the art traded in the world, you would see about 2% of that that would be considered sort of blue chip and highly collectible. And those are often things that we hear about. It's We hear about this you know, Warhol that sold for this Jean-Michel Basquiat painting that sold for $100 million or $80 million or this Van Gogh that sold for this. Those are in a very, very, very narrow market. Um, most of the art traded in the world trades it under $15,000. So, so most of that market and of that market, a lot of it, a lot of it would be considered decorative. It would be considered, you know, artists that are making works or, or work that is coming into the market that is, that is almost it's bought and it's bought through a decorative lens. It's bought because I like it. It's bought because I want this in my home. It's bought because it fits the space for me and I register something emotionally with it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that piece is going to be the next Van Gogh or that artist is not going to be the next Van Gogh. So you, you kind of you can't bucket the art market into one thing. It has its layers and its stratas. So when we're developing our collections for folks, we're really looking at it through the lens of how we build a curated experience. So some of that artwork that we're putting in place will be of collection value and some of it will be more of decorative value. And that allows through a pricing structure for organizations to get around it. So they, they have a budget, they're doing a, a renovation to a hotel or they're building out their corporate headquarters. Not every piece or placement of art has to be investable or uh, a return on investment. Some of it just really fits that emotional need and connection to the brand at the time. So that we are able to really curate experiences that sort of toggle in, in, in between those deltas. If that, does, does that make yes. sense to you? Yeah, it does. Yes. And um, so, you know, we do, we do also manage an art fund. So, you know, we, we manage a contemporary art fund here in Canada, the, the only one of its kind. And part of the reason that we started that was because A, we had a passion for art. Uh, B, we wanted to support artists. And, and, and C, we sort of saw that, that, that a lot of these folks that were bringing these great art pieces to were looking at the values and going, man, that seems really expensive. I, I don't know if I want to take the risk on it. You know, it was a collectible piece. Maybe it's $100,000 or maybe it's $400,000 or maybe it's $50,000. So what we would do is step in and, and make the acquisition of that work. We would hold that work for them and lease it to them in their space and then build an, a, a sort of tertiary collection around it that was more priced uh, in, in a decorative lens that they could connect to and afford. And that's 
that that's been an interesting uh, piece as well. It get it gives them access without risk. Um, it's it's a leasing agreement, sort of an off balance sheet piece, and they can they can have that piece, participate with it, and we we sort of support them in it, own it, insure it, sort of manage it through that that process. So it, it's just creating access, really. Yeah. And also, when you're selling art, I think a lot of business talk about solution sell, right? You know, it's not just like we try to sell a product, but, you know, in business, in now business, unless you understand the problem and we provide solution, your product is irrelevant. And with art, you must be the master of it because, because you start talking about the ability to post, the ability to actually enjoy this. You don't actually go there and say, do you want to buy painting? I'm sure I'm sure you are not doing that because if one of your sales team going to somewhere, going to my company and said, do you want to buy this art? The first response will be no. So you must be an expert in understanding solution problems into, into your product that we can all learn. That, that's my opinion. Well, I, I, think, I think we've got a great team. So I think our team comes to it through this lens of always we want to change lives with art. So they're looking at they're looking at whatever client through that client lens, all the stakeholders in the business and 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 the users of that space and looking at it through um, how do we help enhance this environment and make it better? And so it comes down to storytelling, really. Yeah. How do we craft a narrative and a story that connects to people in place? And then we we start to collaborate with artists and creatives, ours and external, to build out that collection that's meaningful and makes it. So it's not, it's not, it's never us <clears throat> going into an environment and saying, you have to buy this. It's really a conversation about, well, who are you? What's your brand? Who do you represent? Where are you located? Who, who are your users and your people and your culture? And then we start to build out a, a, a red thread, a storyline that goes all the way through the business and we connect that to uh, through an art lens. We really, we, we talk about it, we sort of say beyond art. You know, it's really, it's it's a, a piece of what we do is really connecting to experience and brand. Um, and, the, and the relationship there could be physical art, it could be digital, it could be, you know, a sculpture, it could be an installation that's temporary, it could be public and private, but we're always looking through the lens of what what is the, what is the user or the experience that we want them to have through that lens of art in their brand or in their location? So yes, wow. Uh, that that's just Natalie. I'm not sure whether I'm uh, I'm trying to see alignment, but uh, when you say beyond art, uh, one of the, beyond what? <laughs> one of the tagline in my organization. Uh, we are a 70 years old company, and when I took over the company, uh, I said we have a tagline called Beyond Light because our company is a, a largest manufacturer of lighting and supplier. And uh, a lot of people ask why Beyond Light? Because exactly what you say, Todd. Like, I mean, if we, whether it's plumbing, mechanical, noodle shop, kebab shop, uh, if you, if that's the only thing you hold on, then you can't be, you can't be passing through a lot of challenges. We have to sit further. And I like the way you, you, demonstrate all this through your conversation um you know uh involvement solution what's your brand uh, how can we come and actually elevate your position uh, and i think that's one thing that sme can learn from you uh, the fact that as a business you need to invest in time to think through this and my question to you do you actually have a process and a time where your team actually sit down configuring this or it's become already because you do it so well and you are a 20 years old business like you don't need or, or you actually with discipline say okay let's stop let's think through this can you share with us what's the process that small business can do to configure uh yeah I, function? I think to, to that point i think it always starts with a conversation and you have to get all the participants at the table so you you, you know certainly in a space like art where it's it's it can be intangible to people we we really need to get buy-in from all so we need to bring all the stakeholders to the table we need to have a conversation about the vision for who they are whether it's a brand or a specific location a, a hotel or a, or a corporate entity 
yeah. we, we, we really, we lend that conversation to starting through who they are. What does your brand represent? We look at their values. Do their values align to our values? Can we actually support you? And, and are we a good partner for you? And then from there, we really build out a roadmap, a strategy in terms of through sort of a phased approach, how we can help build an art collection for them it, or an art experience, whether it's through uh, EGD, uh, which is environmental graphic design. We, we do a lot of that in corporate spaces where we're developing quite literally custom wall covering and wallpaper that is artisanal in, in, in relationship and, and, and visual it's connecting to an experience and it rolls up to the other art pieces that we're going to put, but it's starting to, it's starting to focus the brand um, into their place of whatever specific geo region, whatever people or, or users of the space uh, are, are, are there engaging with and connects to them. It, and you just, it's quite a simple experience when you want, when you actually go through it. I mean, we often say we know we've done a good job when we don't hear back because people have, they just sort of walk through the space and they go, Oh, it feels great. You, you know, you've kind of connected there when you walk into an environment. And we know this from our own experiences going into hotels or, or corporate centers, you walk in, you have sort of that much time to go, it feels good or it doesn't feel good. So for us, it's sort of a litmus test. You, you, you're going to walk in and you're going to see some things. If you're a lighting consultant, you know, you want to be putting a great lighting package in the space that needs to connect to the design. Um, as the art consultant, we want to be putting a great uh, you know, sort of art experience in there that's engaging so that your user, your guest feels, you know, that's a sort of a crazy word to use in sort of business language, but feels connected to the space and therefore is creating value that seems intangible, but it is actually quite tangible because they want to be there, spend their money, stay longer. They feel comfortable. They feel rewarded by being there through that, that net experience. So that's really how we approach it, but it starts with, it starts with the, the key stakeholders and building alignment with them. And the best way to build alignment with them is to build a narrative or story that we can all connect to. And then once we can connect there, we can bring in artworks that are maybe a bit strange to them. They just, it, it, but we, if we can layer it back to the story, to the narrative that we all had consensus on and agreed to, then that allows us to move forward. Yeah. Well, you know, when you, you talk about this feeling, and I just want to share a, a local hospital uh, recently had a new wing create, uh, built, uh, Beautiful. And this feeling that you explained, you walk through the original part of the hospital and you turn into the wing. Now the lighting combined with the artwork, combined with the colours selected for the walls, yep. I actually went, wow, this is nice. It's I felt I forgot that I was actually in a hospital for that moment really? yep. until I moved into the other, you know, got to the other wing. That corridor... And what they created was a completely different atmosphere. And I forgot. It created that, wow, nice feeling that I was actually forgot that I was in a hospital. So right. I can definitely understand where you're coming from with this feeling. Yeah. So we, there was a hospital that we, we, we worked with with an architectural firm, a, a great firm called HKS in America. Um, the, the hospital was in Atlanta. It's called Piedmont. We were the art uh, consultant uh, advisor for that project. And when we looked at it, it was a, they were, they were adding to the hospital. And part of what they had to do was they had to, they were taking over a street and adding a, a new wing. <clears throat> and part of the street was lined with these beautiful trees. And people were, you know, quite concerned that the trees were coming down. Um, so what we wanted to do was really pay homage to that, that environment. It was, a, it was sort of a neighborhood feel. It was tr lots of tree lined streets. People felt that canopy when they were going to the hospital. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to reinvent that canopy. And we all know that when we go to hospitals, particularly now to your experience, when you're walking, you're walking through these corridors and you're walking through halls and sometimes you don't know where you are. And traditional wayfinding would stay, oh, you're on floor one or you're on floor eight and it's this wing. So what we did, we did our team, creative team um, came in and we said, well, why don't we build a canopy of flora and fauna and we'll color each layer like a forest floor so we go all the way up to the sky we come all the way down to these darker earth tones so that in 
in, you know, sort of by narrative, we're engaging the community, we're engaging that tree lined uh, sort of street that was there. We're talking about those trees, bringing them back in and building a canopy, and then doing it through a visual lens that acts as wayfinding. So you know that when you're on floor, you know, sort of mid tier floor four, you're sort of in this other color. And you're moving up, you're elevating through color so that you know when you're one floor down, you're on a different color, you're on a different floor. And it starts to translate to you. Um, and you, you, as a user, you're not going to get that, <clears throat> but you're going to feel it, right? You're not going to get it immediately, but once you start navigating through the space, you can quickly navigate and have an understanding of why. And then if you can dig into the story, you understand why certain sculptures are placed, why there are certain themes uh, inherent to the project. And it all starts to build upon the experience of, of, of why, really. That's great. You know what, Todd? You just have a solution for multi-story car parks. They randomly <laughs> select the colors. I always get lost. But oh, if we had some sort of starting, it would be yeah. brilliant. Yeah, uh, it sounds, like a new, sounds like a new business line. Thanks, now. <laughs> isn't it interesting? I, it I, is I really interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Like the way you explain it, Todd. And I think this is where we all can learn from each other. I mean, like for business to learn from a global leading art business based in Canada, and you put a concept of something that I'm just thinking before. When I go to a hospital, you are right. Everything looked the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference that I, in Australia, uh, mostly, we look to the floor and the floor have different lines with different color. So we're following mm -hmm. that line to where we go, but it's difficult to remember. But I think I will remember if the whole environment is actually reflecting where I am uh, in that time, I will be no problem. I can remember, okay, we're going to the green level or something like that. Like yeah. it was the feeling, you can't forget feeling, you can forget math. <laughs> in my, in my right. opinion, anyway, like, I mean, it's uh, you are on level three, three, is it three, is it four, is it eight? Yeah. Right. But green is green. So, so isn't that, you know, isn't that fascinating? That's one thing as humans, we all have, doesn't matter what part of the world you're from, we all have that in common. We feel those experiences through art, whether it's music or performance uh, or, or visual arts. There's a moment that you've, you've witnessed something and it's, it's, it's emboldened in your mind forever, right? You have that, that meaningful touch point and it will always come back to you. And that's, you know, that's, that's why I love art it is because it has that effect on you. And what's really enriching for us as a team is when we get the opportunities to work in different, you know, different cultures with different people and different geo regions, and we can connect on that level. We might not even speak the same language. You know, we might not even be able to understand one another in our first conversations, but we can look at something and we can both have that same reference point and that same feeling it, you know, for us, that's, that's a really enriching experience. Yeah. So Todd, can I can I just uh, be, like I want to test this? I want to test this. Uh, assume that you're not running farm boy arts, but you're running farm boy mechanics, car mechanics. Same one, farm boy car mechanics. As a car mechanics company, you are the managing director. How do you create? So so I I just want to get this right. So I totally agree with you. The minute your business can create an experience where your customer can feel it, that customer will stay with you. That customer will, be, because that's what's missing. You know, uh, car oil is a car oil, uh, I guess. But how do you, how do you, uh, how do you create a feeling if your services is, is a product like that? Like, like, is it any, can, can you, play it differently so we can understand like uh, just try your, your best i guess i'm sure. putting you on mm -hmm. yeah I'm sure i mean I, I wouldn't i wouldn't uh know the first thing about running a car <laughs> mechanics business <laughs> but i could i would say it comes down to the experience again i mean if i'm if i'm um driving a particular brand of car and i take it to uh take it in for service well, when I walk into that service facility, I want to be greeted and I want to feel like I'm welcome and that that my uh, my time in the most authentic way is being met honestly. And I am a valued 
customer. And, you know, it's, it, I think it's just a very simple, uh, it's a very simple thing that translates all businesses. Yeah. If, if, if we're just told to buy something and there's no care into why we're buying or what it is or how we, you know, how we actually connect to it, it's, it's not that meaningful and it's very transactional and maybe we do it once or twice, maybe we have to, <clears throat> but the, the, the meaningful relationships and long-term uh, sort of loyal customers are those, or those that are treated through that lens of sort of authentic experiences and being connected to whatever it is that you are uh, buying or, or, or servicing or, or, you know, participating with. So, you know, you, you, I mean, you see, you see car manufacturers do a very good job. I mean, you know, Ford Motor Company does a really good job in, in engaging their customers today and how they choose to uh, connect in future. I mean, they're, they're, they're making big changes too, um, as, as the new demographic and buyer is changing. I think that's also the other piece is that we have to adapt. You know, we have to be open to the new consumer and what the market is asking of us to offer them. Yeah. I think if we stop hearing that, then we're probably, uh, we're losing ground quickly. And I, I agree. I mean, uh, you know, uh, when we go to a car mechanism, uh, it's it's one one service that is quite common. They are very very quick in expectation. We just say yes. Uh, every question we look stupid. You know, even a question like what type of oil we can put. Do you the 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 service is beyond just we take the car and the car can run. That right. starting point where we come in, get greet well. Uh, they provide a time extra minute to answer Natalie the type of oil with the different yeah. prices, isn't it? Like, uh, well, it's all it's all people, isn't it? I mean, it's all people. It's yeah. you know that is a that's a net result. We're going there to have something done, but it's really the process and the experience that we have along the way that determines our outcome. And if we want to go back, maybe we go to a different dealer. Maybe we sell that car. If that experience was terrible, <laughs> I mean, think yeah. about it in terms of when more cars are becoming. <clears throat> um, uh, battery powered. Yes. I mean, they're not requiring oil, you know, they're not requiring the same types of service that we're used to. So, you know, if I was running that, I would be looking at, okay, if I'm not doing, if my money was in oil changes and all my cars are battery powered and I'm doing way less oil change, I'm not doing oil change because it's not a combustible engine anymore. Then I should be thinking about, well, how do I engage the, how do I engage my, my, my buyers, my, my clients, um to come in so i'm looking at new social connections maybe I mean, and I'm that's the bingo that. of this topic yeah. today i think for every business owner the, at the end of the day your business can go further when there's people coming back to your business and oh, the only way people coming back is if they've experienced and they're feeling through the get-go is a positive experience right yeah i mean i mean this is this is what we all know by running businesses. It's, it's way harder to bring on a new client than to service an existing one. Absolutely, right. Yeah. So the, the, the lift required to build, to build a net new client is it, it can be tough. Um, whether you, and if you've got a great client work to keep them. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. And this all comes down to that customer life cycle management, isn't it Todd, where, you know, you've, you bring them in, but then it's about keeping them on. Right. Definitely. Yeah, and it's it's <laughs> yes. it's what what is the value that you provide to them? And I think we've sometimes we forget about that. Um, it, you know, in, in business, we we we're always thinking about what's revenue, what's revenue, you know, what's our next quarter going to look like? What's our? I mean, I, I've talked to certain folks in the in certainly in the traditional agricultural space. <clears throat> you know, my just history of my my family. There's folks that think. They don't think three and five year business cycles. They think a hundred year business cycles, right? They think, you know, what are we doing to the land over the next hundred years? Not how much money are we going to eke out in the next quarter? They don't think that way. So it's really understanding who, what your, you know, what your business is, what your customers are expecting of you and how you service them and not just looking for that quarterly revenue target. Um, 
Yeah. Not always easy. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And, and speaking of revenue, Todd, we got a lot of engagement when we started talking about, you know, pricing correctly. So I have no doubt there's listeners out there who are, you know, small or medium business owners who may possibly be struggling with understanding how to price their products or their services. Do you have any advice or tips and tricks for them to better understand how to price their own products? Is there perhaps research involved that they need to do? Uh, you know, competitor analysis. Is there anything that we can give them so they can walk away and go, okay, I need to go away and do this? Yeah, I mean, I would, I mean, without knowing everyone's business sectors, I mean, I think if you, I can only re relate it to my own business and, and Farm Boy, as we would see it, has never been the cheapest provider. So there's a, we've always looked at it is if you're going to be the cheapest, there's always somebody that's going to be cheaper. So if you're trying to compete on price alone, you, you're likely going to lose that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a runway down. Um, and, you know, in, in us, we, we really look at what's the, what is the value of the service we're providing, whether that's time and we charge accordingly. Um, if it's product, we're looking at the value of the product to the individual brand, but it's 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 systematic across. So it's it's consistent. So people are getting consistent pricing from us um, and they're getting what they look to as value uh, for that for that product. We don't want to gouge. We don't want to be, um, you know, uh, we don't want to be crazy. We want to price uh, fairly. Um, and we want our, our customers to have a great experience with what they, with what they buy and, and how they buy it. And they want to, we want them to have great value out of it. But yeah, I mean, just, just sort of farm boy economics is we're never going to be the cheapest. We don't want to be, uh, you know, often if you try to be, it's just, it, it becomes just a, 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 a game of inches, uh, and you often lose that battle over time. But listening to you, though, I think your business, uh, if, 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 if a customer looking at it as a totality, I think your business actually giving a totality service at the cheapest rate. Because if you have a cheapest product, you do not have money to keep employee to be having time to talk to you. Your business right. allowing your employee to sit down before selling the products or the solution right. asking how their business go about, what they want to achieve. Well, the reality is farm boy fine arts have to pay their time before the customer actually even agree to purchase. And I think it's a great business. I think it's no longer about whether your product is the cheapest or the most expensive. The totality of the solution that farm boy fine arts give to the market allow you to sit down understand what they want to achieve, enhance how everyone feels through the product that you actually provided. And I, I think the minute a business understand this, they can go to the next level. That, that's how yeah. I No, it's, it, 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 it's an interesting observation. It's, it, you know, I'll give you an example. We, we had a, a hotel client maybe, maybe eight years ago. Um, we went to them. We were super super passionate about the project. We wanted to take the project on. Uh, it was close to our heart. We wanted to do it. The, the, the money that they had indicated within their art budget was quite small. And we said, well, let's, you know, let's have a conversation about what you think that should be. And we set all the stakeholders down. Everybody sort of argued their position as why it should only be this. And we said, well, let, let's, let's start. Let's start. We'll go and we'll start to engage your teams. We'll engage the staff. We'll start to build up this narrative in this art collection. You know what happened? They got such tremendous engagement from their team, from their front of house, back of house staff, that they ended up doubling their budget, um, which, you know, we, we never go to a client and say, you should spend more. We, we always go to a client saying, well, what do you have available? Let's try to be efficient with the money because we understand it. it it's, it's often, you know, it's, it's hard to understand until you really get into it. But they came back and they and they really doubled uh, their their budget, which they never thought they were even going to spend an inkling of what they started to. And what happened was they ended up having a whole other piece of experience: people traveling to the hotel, booking tours, 
we, we were we had to we had to come in and educate the team the staff we've probably done 50 hotel tours um, with staff with guests people would fly specifically just to see the art collection and stay in the hotel and they they had they, they were just like oh, we never saw that we, we didn't think that actually would happen so the, you know when you're greeted at the hotel the front of house staff is going people are going oh that's a really cool piece of art I never and the, 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 you know, the concierge or the reception is saying, well, this is by this artist and here's a, here's a, a book about it. Here's a tour, you know, they were, engagement just went up through the roof and the experience that they had based on that created more revenue, more opportunity and a, and a, and, and a tighter culture within their teams, which they never expected would happen. So we see that happen. But if, you know, but if I went to them in the beginning and, and said, you've got to spend this, yeah. they would, they would, they would look at me like I was a bit crazy, you know, yeah. but they really lived that experience and they, and they ended up, you know, completely uh, reaping the benefits of it, you know, both culturally and financially. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. And Gus, I'm looking at uh, the time we've gone over time. So I'm going to have to hand it over to you to wrap it up. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. So, thought once again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, you spend your time. It's uh, late in Canada today, um, and yet you spend your time to share your insights on leadership and business. Um, as mentioned by Natalie before, if we can learn from a company that's providing art uh, as a business, many, many business providing products, we can learn a lot from you because your product relate to make others feel good. And I think one thing that I learned is there's a couple of things. Um, your purpose as an organization, uh, fine uh, farm boy, fine art, is very, very strong. It's a very infinite, infinite purpose to change life through arts. Your business successful because you're building that value alignment from the get-go, from the recruitment process, you already search for people to enter your business that can understand that your business is not selling arts, but to change life through arts. And I think a lot of people can learn from that by reassessing their purpose from the get-go. Then you said, if you have passion and will, there's always a way. And that's including how you take risks when you need to pivot, because the reality is, uh, if you want your business to go for 100 years and beyond, uh, to assume that the current business will be relevant next year, 10 years, 20 years is false. You need to be very open. You need to be very brave. But then you hold your values and your vision and your purpose, which is, in your case, coming back to change life through art. And then the last thing that I will remember is create a solution that touch the people so they understand how they feel. So anyone listening to this, anyone watching this all over the world, this farm boy fine arts based in Canada can service your business, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, you know, they service business everywhere. And if you want to know how to make your service felt by your clients uh, through arts, then Todd Towers, the CEO and managing director of Farmboy Fine Arts can help you. Uh, if you want to get his detail, contact us through Natalie or myself, we can pass through his details. So Todd, thank you so much for your great insight. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we wish you a great success at Farmboy Fine Arts. Thank, thank you. you. Gustav, Natalie, really appreciate the time. Wonderful to connect with you, and and uh, you know we're, we're we're all living in the metaverse these days, so uh, <laughs> nice to uh, be 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 better to be in person. But it's it's wonderful to see your faces and and share this uh, experience with you. So thank you uh, both for your time, and um, thank you for thinking of Farm Boy, and, and certainly uh, have the best uh, uh, best of season and Merry Christmas to you both and your families, and uh, wish you wish you a, a safe uh, twenty twenty two. Swift and healthy 2022.
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Todd. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, for more information on Leader Talk and for some great resources to help your business grow, check out brainiac.com.au. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.